And meanwhile, I'm happy to invite Mike Marcus already to stage as our moderator. And he will be accompanied by who? Uh, so the topic will be how can we increase the pool of top international talent in the Nordic Tech Valley? And I would like to now invite the other panelists. So, Pirat, please join us. Agne, uh, Marek and Eva. So, guys, from the back rows, take your seats, please. So, uh, warmly welcome also on my behalf for the second part of the panel discussions. So, my name is Markus Vartiovara. I come from Helsinki, Hanken School of Economics. And uh, I'm particularly happy to be here back in Estonia uh, due to multiple reasons. I'm a former internet entrepreneur since 25 years back. And I remember collaborating already at that point with uh, Estonian uh, tech teams. Um, also investor into Estonia through our family company sent 10 years back, which has been profitable from the start as well as our Finnish company's mother company learning a lot from you Estonians. So it's uh, actually, I've uh, lived the experience of working together and learning and being better, hopefully, this way together. But also because I'm running back home an incubator at, at Hanken School of Economics, an incubator which I feel is currently the most exciting part of the university system. So on the third mission of the universities, not only producing research, not only producing high quality education, but impact. And impact in terms of companies, impact in terms of jobs, uh, impact in terms of change and societal change. And uh, so uh, in those terms, I'm super happy to be a part of what I call in my mind, startup nation of the world, Estonia, because uh, you lead in so many indicators with regards to this VC capital, entrepreneurial spirit, and um, uh, a really good pragmatic can-do attitude. But together, we have a wonderful panel here ahead of us that's going to tackle now the second part of our discussion, uh, which has to do, I think, with the most important ingredient for growing these ecosystems, and that's talent. How can we increase the density of talent here uh, in the Nordics? And uh, trying to make the sense of this uh, topic, which will be a scratch on the surface, we will have a wonderful panel starting off with Eve. And I would ask actually all of you to do a brief introduction of who you are in your own words and what companies or organizations you represent. And then we'll tackle the topic of today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Markus. Uh, I'm Eva. I'm head of uh, Startup Estonia. It's a governmental program uh, initiative to make sure that the Estonian startup ecosystem is, is really uh, perfect for startups to be grown and, and, uh, and born. But um, the main mission why I'm sitting here is that um, more and more uh, what the, the favorable ecosystem means or what the favorable environment means is making sure that there is enough talent, that we mobilize the talent from inside the country, from all the you know, ages, uh, genders, backgrounds, but also how we get the talent from uh, other countries to come in here and how we can kind of uh, make sure that the talent flows freely and the knowledge flows with them. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Marek Kisa, and uh, from my heart, I am an engineer, uh, and uh, like Deep Tech is uh, very close to my heart. But here I'm representing uh, a Japanese fund, uh, Nordic Ninja, uh, which is active in uh, uh, Scandinavia and the Baltics, and uh, we have 20 companies in portfolio, and I'm talking about this a little bit later. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hakana, and uh, I am representing here uh, Jobatical. Um, uh, from my heart, I'm HR, has, have been already over 10 years, and um, have recruited a lot of talent uh, to Estonia. So Jobatical now is uh, using AI and technology to make a relocation process twice um, um, more speedy, and, and also uh, three times uh, less expensive in uh, 30 plus countries. So we have a bit experience. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, I'm Birat. I'm uh, leading the talent acquisition team at uh, Skeleton Technologies. Um, a little bit about uh, Skeleton. Uh, so basically we are producing and developing supercapacitors and currently building the biggest supercapacitor uh, manufacturing in the world in Germany. Um, yeah, about us, I'll say from the talent point of view as well, we are I think representing uh, everything from the scientists until the different kind of engineers and operational roles, so never boring. <laughs> Great. So before kicking off the discussion, uh, I'd like to share a story I just heard recently this week back. And this was from an Indian friend of mine who had come with a bigger delegation to Estonia some years back, meeting with government officials and trying to get the basic facts uh, on table to start with. And um, they started off with um, the facts of the population. We talk about 1.3 million people. And the Indian delegation stopped and was 1.3, that's actually the same number that we have at home, but it's not millions, but we have billions. And uh, <clears throat> the discussion went uh, forward on this that we're talking about 10 or with a thousand times difference. And the world is a rather big place where uh, since then the, Estone, uh, the Indian population had grown from 1.3 billion to nowadays 1.4 billion. So we're talking about 100 million extra people. If we take the whole Nordics, if we talk here, uh, we have around 28 million people. So we have four times the Nordics since that uh, encounter has happened. So just to put into scale that uh, how do we do talent acquisition, we are obviously not playing with numbers and maybe it's good so. But uh, we should play with quality and how do we access the best quality to this region and have the best uh, quality of life on the planet if we work our uh, formula as well in terms of creating jobs and, and societies. But with that uh, backdrop, we are obviously facing a global competition. It's not only the boxes of Estonia, Finland and Sweden, but it's a European play, it's a global play, and it's a global uh, competition of good talent. And we thought about starting off with a quick view of this region in terms of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So my challenge to you, dear panelists, come up with your top one perspective of strengths of this region. Why are we stronger than the rest of the world? Right now, I think, besides the obvious facts that we all have beautiful nature and cool companies to work at and, and the best universities in Europe, probably, um, I think the strength that may come as a surprise is the urgency or the scarcity that we're facing now, um, that we all feel. Uh, just to bring an example, last year when we came to uh, Helsinki for a study trip, uh, we were warned, like, there's probably not all doors are going to open for you. They don't really care about, you know, you Estonians going for a study trip and, you know, you know they are, they're doing fine on their own. Uh, but we, it didn't go like this. Actually, we, we met a lot of interest and a lot of questions uh, that we had, like, how, uh, what are we missing here? What nooks and crannies have we not looked behind that we can actually boost our you know, uh, strengths together? And after that, uh, the Danish delegations, the Swedish delegations, the Norwegians, all of them are somehow having the same questions. So that's the, the scarcity or the urgency or the feeling that we are not quite doing something fast enough or, 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 or uh, first uh, is, is our strength at the moment. A hunger still. A hunger, I yes. Great. <clears throat> uh, I, I do have a, a little bit longer answer. So uh, it's, uh, uh, we have been in, investing now for five years. We have 20 companies in portfolio, six uh, very good companies in Sweden, six very good companies from Estonia, uh, and uh, six companies from uh, uh, Finland, uh, one co uh, or two companies from, uh, uh, from Lithuania. So. Uh, uh, we have four unicorns and two Estonian unicorns and two Swedish unicorn, unicorns. So, uh, so Finland, catch up. <laughs> catch up. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, and if we are deep diving in, in these companies, uh, so, uh, and uh, I'm trying to answer to your question, then, uh, then all these countries, uh, they are having uh, 
brilliant universities, very good universities, and, uh, and uh, Swedes have a much longer corporate culture, uh, Finns have very, very strong corporate culture, Estonians have nearly not corporate culture at all, or very small one. Or you limited. have startup culture, which can be exactly. even stronger. Which is, uh, which is making these unicorns. Uh, so 10 unicorns in total in Estonia, it's, uh, it's really not bad if we are talking Finnish. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, the, these countries are very different. Uh, but, uh, but if we are taking the talent of, uh, of startup uh, uh, companies. So these are the gold mines for these countries because uh, if we are taking a, let's say, IT architect who is working at, uh, at Verif in Estonia, he's out of his uh, or her salary. Uh, there are, usually they are uh, quite high and, and the, the state is taking quite a huge stake plus that they are spending all this money locally. This is a global company which is selling its services. So, so all the money stays in this country. So this means that, that uh, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, they are going to fight for this talent. Who is getting the best talent out of this? So this is the challenge with the, what we are facing and then do see in our portfolio currently. Thank you. Great. Back to strengths of this region. <laughs> Thank you. I totally agree with uh, everything. What I would uh, like to add is that uh, what I also heard from the other panelists is uh, that talent attract talent. This is, this is how it is. And also what I would say is that startups also attract startups. Meaning that uh, in Estonia a lot of schools uh, have our startups who are talking about uh, how it is how hard it is, but also how fun it is. And uh, students want to become entrepreneurs more and more. So I think that this is kind of like going forward and forward. And it wasn't like this five years ago even. So it's evolving. Great. I would uh, maybe like to expand uh, a little bit of, let's say, all of your ideas, what was already mentioned, but uh, uh, especially when, let's say, differentiating from, uh, from let's say, our neighbors from, from Sweden, from Finland, I think overall, like the, um, let's say, way of living is similar. Uh, at the end of the day, how people are making the decision, which kind of company to choose, which kind of, let's say, um, uh, country to, to relocate, uh, well, at the end of the day, I think uh, still uh, the product, the company that they would be joining at, that would be one of those, let's say, main reasons to, to, to make the decision. So I would say that um, definitely something that uh, Agne also mentioned, that, uh, you know, startup attracts the startup, then um, let's say, um, I think the different kind of uh, competencies or the companies that we have represented, uh, I think the level is uh, so high per I don't know, per square meters or, or I don't know what the, what's the measure, measurement should be, but, uh, but really that's, that's the main thing what I usually see in, in talent acquisition, in recruitments, then usually it's the, product, pro it's the product, it's the project that people are ac actually making the final decision based on. Great. And to give a little bit context, you know, Finland used to be the, one of the poorest countries in Europe in the beginning of 1900s, even poorer than Estonia. And uh, the way we built the country is basically based on education. I'm personally a big believer in education through research, education. That is one of our maybe core strengths for giving hope to this region. And in multiple ways, Estonia has already superseded Finland. But uh, there's so many areas that you can develop in terms of education towards maybe more entrepreneurial education and building that. We're also heading a research group actually in Finland called the Unicorn Research Group and studying the unicorn phenomena. How come there are so many unicorns per capita inspired by you here in Estonia, as well as Sweden and Finland? And here we tend to see similar patterns of success creating success, talent attracting talent, startups attra attracting other startups, unicorns feeding new unicorns. So from the competencies, when you create unicorn, the, the social capital, as well as the capital of, of uh, creating the the software, these are being expanded onwards. 
Now let's go for the second turn. So let's look at the challenges. And I also invite the audience to think about your own spot of this region. And later on, when we open up the discussion, you might want to complement the perspectives of the panels. So let's be a little bit critical about this region. What are really our weaknesses in this uh, situation? Um, one thing is maybe we don't have a clear idea yet. Uh, that's just my perspective now, how talent really moves, how it really moves, uh, what attracts them, uh, how they grow from, I don't know, kindergarten up to, up to university level, how they choose what they start doing uh, for work, which country they choose to live at. And uh, that, like, I think that whole value proposition is still a bit foggy for us. But what is maybe more urgent is that um, um, talking about the, the tech valley, or the new Nordic deep tech valley. Um, I think our weakness is still that we're kind of blind and we're still arguing over whether Tallinn is better than Tartu or whether Kuopio is better than Tampere. And we, we are kind of blind to the bigger picture in a way. Um, of course, it's defined by what, you know, is sort of, um, what we measure is what you get if, if we are measured by how many units of something of success we produce for this country, of course, that's what we're going to do. And that's how we're going to you know, divide our, uh, our um, resources. But I think it's outdated. I don't think it's going to put us on the global, really, map of, of being a, a talent powerhouse. I think if we, if we just kind of change the shift, uh, shifted our mindset a bit, that would be a good to work closer together and, and maybe find that way. Yeah, so. I mean, the weakness is just like, for us, for just a simple example, we have a really great startup visa program, a really great you know, tool, but we see it as ours. And you, or my colleagues in Business Finland, they say, this is, this is your thing, how do you do it? It's, it's so great. But we fail to acknowledge that this is actually, it works for the whole Schengen area. I mean, you can use it, you can make it yours. And w I mean, it, we're just not used to thinking in these terms. Uh, I mean, Hunken is our university. If I s tell somebody in living in Canada why they should move here, I want to be able to say without, you know, making myself say it, I, I would love this to be natural, say, okay, we have this, we have that, we have, you know, this university, that, we have uh, this company, that cool company, but we are, we're not used to that. We have to train on that. Mm. Marek, what do you think? Weaknesses? <clears throat> yes, uh, so uh, I, I was like comparing in my, my head all these, uh, these portfolio companies coming from different countries and uh, I would like to make a comparison here with uh, Sweden and uh, Estonia. Uh, so, uh, uh, Swedish company, Deep Tech company, Einride, which is making self-driving trucks, uh, they are having 500 plus uh, workers. Uh, they are having 41 nationalities. Uh, there are three founders, two uh, male, one female, uh, and uh, the percentage is 60% uh, male workers and 40% female workers. Uh, so, uh, and, and they are uh, constantly complaining that the mid-age of these 500 is too low and, uh, and they cannot push it upwards because it's very hard to, uh, let's say, import from US and from Asia specialists with the families to, to Sweden. Despite that they're having uh, seven IB schools uh, in Stockholm area and the other seven is uh, international schools. So in total in, in Stockholm there are 14 international schools for the kids. If we are taking a look or deep diving here in Tallinn, Tartu region, then we are having only four or five IB schools and one European school. So, so this means that, uh, that uh, the mid-age of the specialists moving in from US and Asia to Estonia is much lower because uh, uh, they do not have kids or alternatively if their kids are old enough that uh, they do not have to to take care of of, of these these uh, uh, headaches to put the kids to the schools 
So, so this is where I do see like, uh, like a, a problem. Uh, this is also what, what Swedes are claiming. I don't know what's the situation in Finland. I was Googling very fastly and then I got uh, 20 IB schools in the whole Finland, 20. And in Estonia, we have only four. So, so there is a difference. Uh, so I would pass this, uh, this mic over mm, to you. Chobatical has much clearer insight around this topic. So, so could you please comment also further, if it is possible? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, we see a lot of talent uh, coming to Estonia. We uh, help them to uh, relocate and uh, definitely if people are coming with their families, then you will have several problems, like where to put your children to school and, and kindergarten. And uh, yes, there are not uh, so many opportunities. And this is uh, a problem. Um, but on top of that, I would also like to point out that there is also healthcare. So if you are coming with your family, uh, then of course, at some point you need to go to the family doctor. And, uh, and to find that, I already talked about this in Latitude, I think, four years ago, something like that, and the message was the same. So not that much has happened, uh, but um, there are nice new startups who actually take uh, action and uh, have founded something that the employers can use, for example, in Estonia, uh, to um, fill that gap. But still, I mean, um, to get your children to the education and, and also to find the uh, family doc doctor, which is quite, seems so easy but, uh, or simple thing, but uh, is not, then uh, these are the issues. And of course, what we also see uh, from uh, talents coming in, the weather, but let's not talk about that. How big this is a bonus is to stay inside and work. <laughs> Is it like top three, top five? What is like, where is the weather situated in the obstacles? It's usually the fun part that uh, people mention, but it's very cold. <laughs> Actually, weather can be both, uh, how say, weakness as a strength. As Marek said, it's uh, one of the reasons why we work so much on the Northern Hemisphere. We can't go to the beach and enjoy. And, uh, and this is actually, economists have seen that this is a parameter for working, but attracting talents, it's not so easy. It's also the happiness index in Finland, or? <laughs> yeah, we, we somehow beat with the happiness index despite the weather, but I think that's because we have the sauna, but uh, that's another exactly. story. Let's continue. Yes, definitely. It's a similar thoughts uh, from employer point of view as well. So, so I think uh, I would, I would um, put the sign on it or a tag on it uh, or, or a keyword for it, um, long-term uh, talent development, because uh, I think this is also something that um, a lot of companies maybe don't think too. Again, it, it links to another problem that, uh, let's say, we, we don't have enough, uh, enough people for, let's say, for all of us, especially if we're talking about engineering uh, and other technological uh, roles. And uh, then every once in a while, let's say, you do get the talent from abroad, you relocate them here, but you haven't thought through maybe their, let's say, long-term plan or the long-term career plan. So basically, um, you are fixing short-term problem with a long-term solution, which is not well thought through. So let's say that we are hiring an engineer uh, who doesn't have, let's say, really long career progression. He or she will, will fill the vacancy for, a, let's say, let's still consider it a short period of time, like few years, but the candidate is coming here together with the families, um, with wife, with children, with um, cats and dogs, like we have seen, I think, especially Shabbatical has seen like so many of those, uh, like coming with the whole family situations. And then let's say that it doesn't work out. Okay, let's say that um, that person will, will be here like for a few years, but let's say that they don't even last um, um, notice period, or not the notice period, but the probation period. So let's say, how do we help the talents actually, I don't know, to go back? Do we even do it? Mm. I think it's a very good question. In, this, in the end, it's not only jobs competing against jobs. People are looking for where can they find best possible life for themselves and their families. And we need multiple players to make this 
a reality. In some degrees, Sweden is longer, further ahead with internationalization and uh, then Estonia. You can attract different talent based on the maturity of the overall system. But I would maybe lift on, on that domain also another weakness uh, in terms of this region. And it's actually a challenge that I think we should be proactive about is that if, I, if we look around ourselves, for instance, in this room today, uh, the homogeneity is uh, striking compared to if we would be in Stockholm or London or New York. And uh, people coming from different backgrounds, it's really important that we create environments that they want to stay because otherwise they feel that they don't belong to these uh, regions it, and, and it affects on multiple levels. So ensuring and working on diversity, I think, is, is crucial on multiple levels. And maybe that, these are also issues we could work in the Nordics together more. Let's continue our uh, journey, but this time let's start from the other direction. So uh, let's How look at the bright side. Uh, <laughs> let's look at the bright side. What do we see as opportunities for this region? What should we do to really attract talent in, in a better way? Again, I guess we, we like several points, but we have already mentioned can be seen as, a, as an opportunity, can be as a, uh, as a weakness. So I think one side, the good thing is that, uh, or like the, let's say the challenge is that we don't have enough people. The good thing is that we don't have enough people. So actually the circle is quite close. So, so the networking, I guess it's overall is, uh, is quite easy. I think in Estonia or like overall in, in the Nordics is that uh, everything is so close by and everybody knows everybody. So I think actually building up the businesses should be quite feasible, should be quite easy. Yes, I would continue uh, with that. Uh, we have already a lot, like we have built a lot. This uh, We have the system working. And uh, yes, we have our weaknesses and uh, it's not very easy for the talent uh, to come here and live here for longer. What we also see in Jobarikal that actually the talents don't leave that easily. So uh, when they choose, they actually um, stay in Estonia. They just uh, maybe switch the employer, uh, but they stay because uh, so usually stay. Uh, because they already love this environment, it's a small country, and uh, it's like safe. So if we see that a lot of talents are coming uh, from India, Turkey, uh, Philippines, then they say that, wow, this is a small country, but it's very safe for me and my family. So this is important, and how to now go further with all that, what we have already, that is my question. Like. Uh, can we be sustainable with these things and develop further the weaknesses? Um, yeah. A very good question. I think that we have done something right. So, uh, so otherwise, uh, the, the numbers that we are measuring against, uh, they, are, they are very good ones. And, uh, and uh, it, it has been... Mm, quite a short period uh, for Estonia, for Finland and Sweden also to uh, rethink uh, what a startup and then what, how to build a startup nation. So uh, uh, I'm, uh, we do see like uh, mm, Japan, Japan as, a, as a country, uh, we have uh, Japanese LPs. And uh, what is uh, the problem with Japan that, uh, that if you are studying at the university, uh, then there, there is approximately, I don't know exact numbers, but I, if I recall right, then it, it was like 95 to 98% of the students would like to work for the corporates because this is a very stable work. And uh, to to 5% uh, they would be entrepreneurs or they did not understand the question. So, so, so and uh, uh, this, the same situation was a little bit uh, 1995 when I graduated from Stockholm Technical University. So, so all my, my uh, classmates are working for the corporates uh, and very few started their own, own businesses. 
today's picture is completely different. Uh, so uh, if we are taking KTH in, uh, in Stockholm, latest study was 60% still would like to go to corporate or the state, and 40% uh, plus would like to start their own businesses. And this was, uh, they are by themselves saying uh, that uh, this is because of, uh, of uh, all these successful startups like, uh, like Spotify, Klarna or whatsoever. The founders of these companies have created funds and investing in, in the new startups. So the same bubble happened also in Estonia, the same bubble happened also in Finland. So, uh, so these successful startups will be uh, these who are showing, showing the way. So, uh, so I'm, I'm a very strong believer that this is only the beginning. So, so we are going to see this uh, year by year, like uh, uh, from our point, Bolt uh, is, uh, is uh, world biggest OU, as we are saying, and, and, and uh, it has uh, tons of different, uh, different uh, nationalities already working for this company, and they are doing also deep depth work inside this company. So, so these will be the drivers, uh, and, uh, and let's uh, keep our fingers crossed, let's do what we have been doing, and, uh, and, and we are going to gain a lot out of this. Thank you. So opportunities feed new opportunities. So sort of success yeah. creates success. I'm a if very strong keep on believer on that. Yes. What do you see, Eve, still? What kind of opportunities could there be still in terms of uh, attracting talent here? Um, yeah, I'll I'll be looking at it from the let's say the governmental perspective because we're sort of on the mission to to see how we can pull more talent into the region. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of exam uh, of things that we could do. We we could um, do joint talent missions, for example. Like now we're doing each country by themselves. Like we have defined some target countries for where the talent comes from. We do them by ourselves. Maybe even if we're lucky, send a representative there to to do field work. But it could easily be done a, a joint Nordic talent mission. Or another example, uh, if we go to trade fairs, uh, expos, uh, such things, why don't we do a common booth? Or, or let's say we have a common value proposition, which was described earlier as well in, in the panel, but, uh, but we have so much in common, or if not in common, we do fill each other, other's gaps out very well. So we have that you know, the money, we have the agility, we have the partnerships, so, so what if we put that all together and present it as one great opportunity. Uh, also, what we could do is uh, like another simple, uh, simple thing. We have this program um, in our organization, Work in Estonia, which is, you know, on a mission to, to get people to uh, get a job in Estonia. Why don't we have uh, a work in Nordics? I mean, w of course, it needs resources allocated. It needs uh, really a mandate or a, a team, a group, a time frame, something like that, like an, some, some framework to work in, but it's not impossible and it's, it's nothing, it's not rocket science. Um, it, it could be easily done. So a lot of opportunities of working even better together, getting out of our boxes and uh, finding ways to do stuff together. Definitely. To complement that from a university perspective, um, you know, uh, maybe some of you know, what is the way to build a great city? The traditional answer is that you found a university and wait 200 years and you will have a great city. Uh, luckily, nowadays, universities develop quicker, cities develop quicker, but there's a lot in terms of opportunities in getting out of our boxes and developing totally new kinds of universities. And I'll tell you two very interesting examples from Finland. Uh, at Hanken School of Economics, we are combined working with seven other universities in the Helsinki region uh, in a program called the Campus Incubator Program with measurable targets. We have to spit out 100 companies per year. So from this idea of only doing research, only doing education, now our seven universities are collaborating, creating pre-incubation programs to help out creating new companies out of these universities. And it's fascinating to see these universities physically change, getting new people on board, 
sparring the teams to st set up new companies. So a uh, very ta tangible example of, of new opportunities from working together. And this is only Helsinki. And I'll add another one, uh, which brings us hopefully out of this uh, Finland, Estonia, Sweden box, and really starting to look at this could be the coolest corner of Europe, and really look at the opportunities on a European level. Uh, uh, based on the initiative of Emmanuel Macron, uh, there has been uh, taken an EU-level decision, because our universities are so small indiv individually, that let's create European consortia to compete with the Chinese, compete with the US, and uh, through this, uh, consortia have evolved. For instance, my university back home is a part of an Engage EU consortia, which combines 10 top universities from around the, uh, uh, Europe. Mannheim in Germany, Tilburg in Holland. Lu I just came back from Louise in, in Rome. Uh, Esade in, in uh, um, uh, Barcelona, VEU in Vienna, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Ten universities. And to give you a little bit of context, uh, currently Oxford has around uh, 25,000 students. Harvard has 35,000. Stanford has 17,000. This European consortia, of course it's not only about numbers, but numbers give also possibilities, has close to 140,000 students. And these consortia, Suddenly, we are not only seeing EU integration, like countries coming together, but institutions coming together. So create joint doctoral programs, master's programs, uh, bachelor level programs, and innovation labs with each other. So which creates a sort of a European possibility to scale. And I think really, the, how can we get most out of this region as an opportunity is to connect with the opportunities in Europe. Because after all, this is a rather small part of the Europe, but it, this can be the exciting light for Europe uh, for, for doing these kinds of things. And, and uh, what I would voice is that uh, we should take a proactive stance in, in, in a European context and, and get out of uh, just the Nordic mindset. That about a few opportunities. Now, let's also be a little bit realistic and uh, look at quickly the threats. What do you think as main threat for really attracting talent and what is hindering economic progress here. Let's continue from that end. I will think about it a little bit. Agna, you can take. Yeah, I can only think of two threats, like one is our big uh, neighbor and uh, the other one is economy, like uh, both can be unpredictable. So, and that affects us, of course. And uh, we should then, in a startup, it's quite, um, normal that you need to adapt to changes all the time. So we do that, but yeah, I see these two as the main big threats. Yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm continuing uh, uh, this part. So w I, I, I was uh, at one very interesting panel in Israel and, and then we were comparing uh, like Estonia and Israel. Uh, we are having a, a very a uh, huge and, and complicated neighbor, they are having seven complicated neighbors. Uh, so uh, uh, they have, uh, the universities are working very close to military and uh, having, uh, men are having a military service of three years and, and uh, uh, females or, or ladies also two years. And, and they are combining it together. Uh, there are tons of startups uh, coming from, uh, from this sector, uh, which are uh, producing uh, products for dual use. So, uh, uh, so this, is, uh, this makes them strong. And uh, I think that uh, this area, uh, when uh, also Sweden hopefully is going to join NATO very soon, so creates completely different uh, possibilities uh, also, and then this, uh, puts us to, to work much closer together, especially these three countries, what we are mentioning or what we are talking about. So this gives another opportunities, uh, or let's turn these threats to the opportunities. Yeah, um, legislation, taxation, things like that, which are 
not very sexy to talk about, but it definitely hinders uh, also the all the bringing people in. So if let's say we are uh, saying that you know we are not that open anymore, or let's close uh, close our doors to um, countries from from outside the EU, then of course it's not going to be that easy. So that's that's always going to be a threat. But I think it's it's uh, necessary to balance between being open and being careful about like security. So in general, yes. Very good point. So this openness, when we lose the openness, we lose much of the possibilities for innovation. But in certain cases, there's also this openness. It's not all have to do with us, because we are also uh, somehow influenced by the geopolitical situations. And maybe I would lift there also this uh, uh, raising of this blockade, uh, democratic countries versus now authoritarian countries. For Finland, we are seeing a lot of possibilities due to NATO membership. There's flood of different opportunities now coming from, from the US. But very, this very morning, I was approached that uh, if we take, collaborate with this NATO initiative, uh, uh, our entity cannot have anything to do with China. So uh, very clear blockades happening also here in terms of if you uh, seize one opportunity, there you must close the door for another one because of these geopolitical uh, uh, implications, even in open science uh, areas that uh, NATO and, and China are opposing each other. Did you have some uh, further? Can, can I comment this? Uh, I, I love this positive openness. Uh, I just brought an example from uh, uh, Sweden, from the university. There, there is a one uh, spin-off company which is making batteries, which I brought an example that there are if I remember correctly, uh, there are uh, 40 people working and there are uh, 25 different nationalities. And none of them are Swedes, but they are speaking Swedish with, with each other. Wow. So, uh, so this is like, it was like, wow, also to me. And, and building world-class technology inside the Swedish university. So, uh, so this is called like, like mental openness, 40% uh, uh, also uh, women, 60% uh, men, uh, like there is a diversity which is uh, uh, making the change. So uh, if we could be, let's say, mentally and also open uh, for this type of changes in a positive way, so there is only to win from this. Great. I noticed, Marek, that you have spent time in Sweden when you use the words of world class, Vads class. They, if you go to Stockholm, everybody talks about you have to have stuff in Vads class. Uh, and there's one of the few words we can learn from each other, maybe, and maybe some Finnish cuss words. But, uh, Sorry. <laughs> but clearly it shines through and we can learn also culturally. Of course, it's really important how, if you really want to attract talent, like we talked prior, we have to have talent that attracts talent. So actually, I would personally say that we are most important, we would have to challenge ourselves. Are we talented enough? Are we hungry enough, like you ever said, that do we give our best in order for us to deserve to have uh, uh, collaborating with others and, um, and to live up? And I was very happy to hear about actually our fellow uh, friends at uh, Tartu University and this CDL Destruction Lab which in Europe is uh, run from Oxford, connected to Paris, from Toronto labs. How can we get into the best networks of the world? And talking with actually your colleagues at um, Kadri Ukrainski, telling about ha having her uh, guests from Wharton coming in to, to visit Tartu University. We have at Hanken, we have unique networks to Stanford. So how can we really challenge ourselves to be in the, the best networks? Because otherwise, if we are not open, if we are not challenging ourselves to get out there, we are not going to attract the best talent. But on the flip side, we can get the best of the world here. This is one of the brilliant, uh, most brilliant uh, initiative from Tartu University, CDL. So, respect. <laughs> also, respect to actually Estonian entrepreneurs bringing back. So it's not only the university, but also Sten Tamkivi and, and your entrepreneurs that are doing the work uh, for that. So uh. yeah, it all comes it all comes down to networks. Why we are here, why we are talking about this now is 
the, if we talk about deep tech startups uh, from the stage of university, how they build, uh, really how the teams are built from the very early stage, uh, how the university itself uh, builds their team to even you know grow these teams. Uh, I mean, up to how you guys can uh, expand uh, and then hire more people and more people. Uh, this all um, takes a lot of um, different uh, skills. So you even you know you don't even find these skills uh, in in one country. Even if we were 10 million, you still wouldn't find them here. So the more deep tech we go, I think the more we need to look broader and the more networks come into play. So that's why I think this this, this talent is well deficiency is taking a more <laughs> even a critical uh, note now. It has always been a critical thing. Uh, talent has always been the one thing we always talk about that is uh, that is missing and that is actually the one main ingredient in in successful ecosystems. But I think now it's like level next level. Maybe at also one uh, perspective still. You know, uh, we had a big delegation uh, from Japan to come and visit and look at the Finnish education system. And then we asked at the end of that, that what do you think, what was the most remarkable of, of, of the Finnish education system? And for them, it was the empowering of the students. So not only the talent that are now grown up, but how do we foster talent from the beginning in order to have the best possible talent here that can attract other talent? I think it starts from putting our students at the center in the universities, really empowering them in different ways that we have done in our universities before. Uh, this very visit actually to Estonia, we are now bringing in students from Finland uh, with the particular idea to bring them over from here to see uh, now latitude 59, seeing the universities over here. Uh, and I would like to extend the inv invitation for you guys to come over to Finland once we have the slush thing and seeing what, what all kinds of things can happen and this way, putting this ecosystem into work. But dear panel, could we open up maybe briefly for the uh, audience, if there are any questions, uh, uh, also, um, how say, uh, claims with regards to the strengths or the weaknesses, opportunities of this system. <clears throat> Thank you for an excellent panel discussion. Just to put the numbers to a context, for example, from Finland, we're basically losing, we've already lost roughly 100,000 people to retirement, and we will lose roughly 230 to 250,000 people by 2030. So we're talking about really big volumes. So just putting this into a context, I would claim that the best way for us to uh, attract talent is to invest into the educational system and provide a free education for the people who actually come here and work here for their children. So I'd like to hear your comments on this one. So how about making a new thesis that we invest more to the educational system and that provides a platform to attract talent for them to migrate into these economies. There are a lot of other things that we need to fix as well. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one. My thoughts, but uh, maybe the rest of the panel starts if you have some who wants to go. No, I completely agree. Uh, I wish there was a representative of the <clears throat> the rep representative of this uh, minister here, but definitely this has been a topic uh, at the prime minister roundtables uh, almost every time the um, the need for uh, uh, for investing into education more, not not only higher but all the levels of education, and also matching it with the real needs is it's it's one thing to invest, but like how exactly how we where we put our but let's remember, like in most of the countries globally, people have to pay a lot of money to provide an education, upper elementary or university education for their children. That's the downgrade of the American middle class. They're adept for that. So I sort of I think that we do have a competitive advantage, and I'm, it's really frustrating that we don't see any action here. Uh, <clears throat> can I answer this? So, so I'm, I'm just uh, <laughs> exactly. so would like to answer that. Uh, we, we took uh, the initiative in Estonia with, together with the startup sector and then created a, a school uh, call called called Yuffie, uh, together with Mart here. Uh, so, uh, and this is where we are providing kind of digital change uh, in in the students, and uh, the mid uh, age of, of the students is 27. Uh, 
40% are having uh, already higher education, so they are like uh, restarting the career or turning to this uh, digital uh, yeah, uh, future in, in that sense. So we are the, the very strong believers that, uh, that only these people whom we are having so much or so little that we are having that we should create or push more knowledge out of out of these people and and uh, at the end of the day they are also finding their their way let's say to towards this uh, digital future thank you great we are running out of time but i want to say inka i love your idea of course. I Maybe think one more question. This is our strength. One if more it's a question. very short one. It's and then very short one and it's like about the opposite to the, what has been discussed. So I think it might be interesting. So I'm Kari Sinivuori from Ute Scientific and we started the company just before Corona pandemic started. So we don't have any sort of an office culture at all. So why do we need to attract people physically? Why can't you just attract the people to your team and they can be, 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 be wherever they are. Yes, um, for example, our company, we are all remote working. So we have our employees working all over the world from the home office or co-working space. Um, it is possible, it is great, um, but there are also uh, many people who don't like that. So I think that we should have this openness, what we have talked about, to provide opportunities for everyone, not only for remote workers, but also for people who actually want to come into some room, uh, socialize, uh, to eat a banana, and, and so on. So there are different people, and let's have different opportunities. I would also say that the biggest problem definitely is engagement. So. At the end of the day, you can work anywhere, you can do anything, but at the end of the day, you want to feel like, you know, that you're actually part of something. Uh, and if you're like every day working, uh, working fully remotely, again, I guess it's, it is different. People are experiencing it differently, but that's something what we have uh, experienced like at Skeleton as well. We have had roles who are just fully working remotely from another country, another city, um, like just, you know, every once in a while, like, Copy, uh, stopping by, uh, stepping by, but um, but at the end of the day, they, they don't feel this engagement. Now I'll have to cut off here because mm -hmm. we're getting no, looks no, from actually, here. No, actually, on the contrary, we just uh -huh. got the, the text message from uh, Mr. Martin Österdahl that the <laughs> drinks in Kampai are not yet cold enough, so we Ooh. actually have time for one or two more questions before we do the conclusions. <laughs> so if you have questions from the audience, you can still raise the hand while the beer gets cold. We have the former minister here who wants to ask something short, please, yes. Yeah, that is a difficult challenge, but uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me from this panel is we should forget about the sovereign borders. The real border is the ecosystem. Now, uh, on diversity, uh, it's a bit an echo chamber here. We are all local, by and large. But if you think uh, for a talent from Latin America, North America, Asia, what would be really the thing uh, to, to come here? And we discuss, you discussed it in the beginning a little bit, but, uh, but how we can make it uh, more attractive and also more known uh, so that everybody uh, in the world would say, okay, if I have the next move, I will certainly consider the region Nordic Tech Valley as my first preference. So what is missing where, if anything? I think uh, we don't miss that much because we have already built a lot we have startups. The people are coming uh, to live here. Uh, the question is uh, not to worsen anything. Like uh, if we uh, start to have a lot of rules and uh, um, for startups, uh, for example, that you cannot bring uh, more than five people this year or only IT people and so on, then that would be a hindrance. Um, people from Asia and Africa and so on, they would like to come. 
because as I said, it's safe here, it's cozy um, in all Nordics. Like um, there are so many things that people love, the nature and everything in spite of weather. So um, let's uh, talk about these things even more and let's not have the rules that ac actually will hinder us uh, or, or these people to come here. Maybe to expand a little bit, uh, how I see could be the way, because we have these great things built. We have great companies and I see people coming from Brazil to work exactly for this particular company. They've moved from across, across the globe. So what if, to make that decision, only a few crazy people make that decision, uh, to, to have more crazy people make that decision, why not put it somehow clearly, visibly, online or wherever, and to see that, okay, because from looking from Brazil, uh, for example, uh, Helsinki and Tallinn are just two villages, uh, like a little bit apart, maybe not even, you know, clearly apart, uh, maybe just one spot. So, so to present, uh, you know, the opportunities um, as a wider package, let's say, maybe I get tired of working in Jabatical in two years. What do I do next? It's like you said before, how do you plan you know, this person's career for a longer period so that they don't have to uh, move away from this uh, region? Maybe they work in, uh, I don't know, in a Helsinki company for a couple of years, then another couple of years in, in Stockholm and then come back to Tallinn. I mean, maybe just you know, the way I started, the way we think about you know, getting people over is something. A, a short comment from, from my side. So I'm a very strong believer on competition. And in, if we are competing with each other, uh, Finland, Sweden and Estonia in a positive way, then we are building ourselves better constantly. Uh, and uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also saying that uh, do not fix it when it works, but uh, we, can, we can always make ourselves also better. So, uh, from different countries. I think we need to get our message clearer out to uh, South America, to uh, Asia, to Africa, that this is not only the best or like Peter says, the finest future that you can give to your children. And maybe building Marek on your idea from the, all the way from the International Baccalaureate Program, from uh, Baccalaureate Program to INCAS free university system. So can we give the fi finest or the best uh, education and the future to your kids? And take bold statements, take bold decisions to make that, like Estonia has done in many ways, in taxation, in startup visa. But do it also on the education side. That could be a very strong message to the world. I think this is the place where we can applaud now. Yes, thank you. We have ladies running around with candy boxes. Uh, the news from the Kampai is still not there whether the beer is cold enough, but uh, we, we are still going to fill a little bit of your time with a couple of conclusions. Very subjective ones, uh, presented to you, to you by me and uh, Kadri. So uh, we are going to basically like Eurovision style, giving some points out now to our panelists. So who did well and who did uh, do not so well, who will be invited to the next Nordic Tech Valley talks and who not. So no pressure at all. So do you want to start with uh, your favorites? Uh, well, sure. What I like coming from the very start of Silla's presentation, I really loved the, the way she presented the ingredients and then let, uh, left us here to, to create the recipes and then start uh, cooking. So let's, uh, let's uh, maybe the readiness of the state um, Coming from the stage uh, was something I think really to, uh, to, to uh, point out tonight, today, this morning, <laughs> because you haven't had your period. No, still morning. Um, and, and hopefully also the readiness of, of the other Nordic Baltic country states um, is, is the same. So um, I was yeah. really happy, I really wrote that, that down. That, uh, and, um, state is I, I want to continue with one of the like three musketeers sitting in the first front row here, as Markus very kindly put out that we have a very diverse group of gentlemen, all looking very investorish or ministerish <laughs> in the first row here. And uh, Mark was the one who said that if researcher steps out of the lab, there is no one left behind. 
<laughs> so we have a, a systematic error somewhere, so um, we should fix that one. So yeah. your second takeaway. I really like Dinga pointing out actually about the amount of R&D money being available across Europe. So let's maybe unite forces in, in finding it um, and using it together. So you stole one of mine that Dinga uh -huh. had great numbers, but uh, I would still highlight uh, Erkis. Um, micro speed and macro patience. I think this is a great formula, especially for like slow uh, natured people and folks like we are. We are like really good at rally, but that's about where our speed stops. So micro speed and macro patience everywhere. Your third takeaway. Well, I basically wrote down in, in, in like big letters KPIs because um, I'm a fan of those in that sense that in case after this event, we could uh, continue with a white paper of, of stating what we, what we discussed and agreed, and then try to really find what could be the, the KPIs there that we could really come back in a year time or so, or at the next uh, Tech Valley talks, because it's a series as we agreed together with Startup Estonia when we started planning it. So let's uh, not just, you know, give good ideas or, or innovate, but just try to find KPIs there too. Yeah, there were a couple of roadmaps offered, so my last and final part comes from one of the roadmaps, even though I don't remember who was it that who said, uh, I think it was one of the Marcos who said that if people would actually work on the real stuff as much as they are working on the roadmaps, the world would be a much better place. That being said, I'm still going to Inga's like uh, roadmap, so we should adopt Swedish long-term view, Finnish funding model, Estonian friction removal model, and fund it all with Norwegian cash. <laughs> so uh, that was my third one, but uh, we, we still have few mandatory parts. So every event that I have been into, well, almost everyone has an organizer or organizers. And also this one had an organizer. So Startup Estonia, so uh, Kaiti. Sandra, Annika is somewhere, and uh, Eva, of course, as well, but she already got her spotlight. And then we have Estonian Venture Capital Association, so Kadri as well. So let's give a big round of applause to those ladies. And uh, I do love to ask at the end of the events, uh, like, so what? And now what? So what now? What's the next steps? Well, the next step is that let's hope our drinks are cold um, and we can move on to Kampai. But uh, next step, what I mentioned is that uh, I think with the organizers, we will uh, we'll make like a short, precise uh, pool of, of, of takeaways from here. And then um, at least from the VCA side, I would be totally ready to take all the Nordic and Baltic Venture Capital Association leads we do our calls anyhow, regularly, and, and take this talent topic uh, to our next uh, call and, and see what comes from, from, from there. And uh, the very, very final note before I say final thank you, and you cannot go out of the door before the, that, is, and Kati, you will remind me that there was something about sustainability and impact and SDGs and ESGs with these tags. So we were supposed to return them where we took them, unless we go to Kampai. Or, so we need those when we want to get the drinks. Yes, so we need the neck tags if we want to get into the Kampai. The security is very tight there because that's where the drinks are. If you are not going for the drinks, then please return these neck tags to the registration desk uh, because then the other people will not get them and uh, there is four more drinks for the other guys so, uh, who are going. So we want to thank you for surviving this beautiful weather inside a very dark uh, Nordic room. Uh, nobody was killed during this event, as far as I know. Uh, at least there is no crime fiction still formalized. Uh, do you have any final thoughts from your side? I really want to thank everybody that was on stage too. So both of you, thank you. Good thoughts. All right. Thank you. And let's see at Kampai.